And this is the field. This is probably the field where Jesus spoke his very first sermon. This is a very impressive sermon. It's the most intricate, most sublime sermon that has ever been preached to mankind. And most people today misquote this sermon to such a terrible extent. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3 to 10. Jesus starts off by saying, Blessed are the poor. And the word for blessed there is makarios, which means a heavenly blessing. A, a blessing that can only come from a divine source. Such an enormous blessing. And the word used for poor there is the Greek tokos, which means abject poverty. Nothing but abject, abject poverty. Poverty, not one might to rub together. And he starts off his sermon, the Jews sitting there in their thousands, waiting for him to announce himself as the Messiah. And to say, I am the Messiah. You are the chosen people of God. I have come to set you free from the Roman yoke. You will rise and be the greatest in heaven. That's what they're waiting for. And here he gets up and the first words as Messiah that he speaks are blessed are the poor. And there are various words for poor in the Greek and he uses the one which describes abject poverty. Instead of greatness and richness and, and uh, wonder and whatever adjective you'd like to apply to them, they are to be poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And his second beatitude was, Blessed are they that mourn. They wanted to rejoice. They didn't want to mourn. And again, the mourning there, there are different levels of mourning in the Greek. And the Greek word there is pentio, which means abject sorrow. The sorrow that you could have for the loss of an only child. That type of sorrow. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is a meekness that uh, is a humility that you cannot describe in human words practically. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And again, the word hunger there is a hunger pang that you would feel after you've been roaming around for days and days in a desert without food or water. That type of hunger and that type of thirst. What was Jesus doing there? Was he trying to destroy their demeanor? Was he trying to say something else to what they expected? He certainly was. In fact, what Jesus is doing here, he is displaying the Christian walk. That's what he's explaining. And he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, those who realize their bankruptcy. Those who realize that they have nothing to offer. I come to Jesus with nothing to offer. I cannot say to him, Lord, I have one might here. Can I purchase my way to heaven? I've got nothing. I am absolutely poverty struck. I have nothing to offer but a sin-stained life. That's it. So I must come to the point where I realize that I'm poor, that I have nothing to offer. And then the very next step is blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. I must not only realize that I have nothing to offer as a sin-stained individual, I must experience sorrow for what? For sin. I must experience my sorrow for sin and I must look at the Son of God and I must feel sorrow and I must have repentance. And I must say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry for what I have done. Genuine repentance is the next step in the Christian walk. Blessed are the meek. Once you have realized that you are bankrupt, 
once you have realized that you are responsible for the death of the Son of God, once you have experienced real sorrow, there's no more time to ride around on your high horse thinking that you are better than everyone else. Time to climb down and to experience humility and to know that others and God are greater than you. It's a very difficult road for mankind to travel. It's contrary to every human emotion. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be full. Your Christian walk doesn't end with realizing you're a sinner, sorrow for sin, and becoming more humble about yourself it has to continue in a process known as sanctification, which means, Lord, change my vile character. Paul says, I must crucify the old man every single day, and I must ask God to change me. And I have a perfect pattern, which is Jesus Christ, and I must say, Lord, change me into that image, that I may truly reflect me. I long to be more like you and less like me. Because really, I am pretty pathetic. That's the Christian walk. What's the next step? Once you have done this, then you can be merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You see, we tend to believe we are better than others. And then we become judgmental. One of the biggest problems in a church is being judgmental, isn't it? Now, did you know so-and-so still does this and that and the other? And you know, that kid over there, I mean, he's on drugs. I mean, wow, what do you expect? The parents are, you know, this, that, and the other. Instead of feeding the hunger and looking at your own self and saying, well, look at yourself, what a miserable sod you are. Do you think they are any worse than you are? Why can you not have mercy and sympathy on them because God had sympathy and mercy towards you? Isn't that what it's about? So Jesus says, once you have come along this road, once you have experienced repentance, and once you have sorrowed for your sin, and once you've climbed down from your high horse, and once you ask the Lord to change you, that will make you merciful. And you will have pity on those that have not had the advantage of this insight. Blessed be the merciful. And then, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I remember when I came into this church, I came in from the world. I was a hard worldling in a very cutthroat business. University is very cutthroat, and you work your way through the top. And my mind was a sewer. And I said to God, you know, I don't want to have a mind like this anymore. And God will help one to clean up the act and to develop nice thoughts where evil thoughts abound. This is the process of sanctification. Christianity doesn't stop with knowing Jesus. It's no good to know Jesus. You won't be saved by just knowing Jesus. Doesn't the devil know Jesus? Is he saved because he knows Jesus? No. We have to allow God to change us, to clean up our act. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. You see, only once you've gone through the whole series of growth aspects do you come to the peacemakers. What is a peacemaker? A peacemaker is someone who realizes the peace of God in his heart. Great peace have they who love thy law, says Psalms 119. This is a peace which is a heavenly peace. It always amazes me when politicians take that particular beatitude, apply it to themselves, and give themselves huge awards without having gone through any of the previous steps in the Christian experience. That's not a peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who has made peace with God. That's a peacemaker. That's a peacemaker. And blessed are they which are persecuted. Isn't that amazing? For righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What's the very last thing that, that the Lord mentions here? What's the last beatitude? Blessed are they which are persecuted. In other words, if you go through this process, if you feel sorrow for sin, if you ask for forgiveness, if you allow the Lord to change your heart, if you 
are willing to climb down from your high horse. If you want the peace of God in your heart, you will be an irritation to the world. And they will persecute you. It's guaranteed. And that's the process of the Christian walk. Totally the opposite of what mankind in this world wants today. And the lessons that Jesus taught on the Sea of Galilee are absolutely the most fundamental lessons that mankind needs. We need to take our Bible and we need to be aware. If you have a Bible that's marked in red where Jesus speaks, you need to be aware. I must read this carefully. We read them like stories. We must read this carefully because this is God speaking directly to us. Every word is a talent of God. Every word, even the buts and the this, will be in the right places for particular reasons. So we need to pay attention.